church, we'll just click that video. We're, we're excited about this conference. It's an opportunity for us to gather with uh, the global Methodist churches throughout the state of South Carolina. If you've ever been to a church conference, you're thinking, no chance I'm going to something like that. Uh, this is going to be very different. It is going to be a time full of worship. There's going to be breakout sessions that you can pick and choose what you're interested in going to hear, but it is going to be centered around worship, not business. So we want to encourage uh, all our campuses of Lyman Methodist Church to, to register for that. The information has been sent out. It's on, it's on social media, but you can go to their website as well. And if you need help with that, please don't hesitate to contact the office, as we would love to have a great following um, at the Behold Conference. So with that, I'm going to open us officially with prayer, and I'm going to invite our senior pastor uh, to come up and uh, serve communion for us today. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord, it is good for us to it is good for us to gather as a body of Christ. It is good for us to come to this table. Lord, it is good for us to be in your presence. So God, help us to know that, that what we do as we praise you today, as we lift up prayers and concerns, as we hear your word proclaimed, that it's not just for this day, but it's for each and every day of our life. That as we leave this place, God, we want to be a, a people campus in a church that truly lives out the gospel of Jesus Christ. So pour your peace and your presence upon all those gathered here today. God, may you receive praise. May you receive honor. And may you receive the glory for all we do and for all we say today and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Pastor Eric, if you'll come up and bless us. Amen. You know, it's
single person gathered here and worshiping online, and on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine, Lord, we ask that you would make it eat for us, your body and your blood, that we might be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Lord, make us one with Jesus Christ our Lord, one with each other, and one in unity to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast his heavenly banquet. We honor, glorify, and praise you, Lord, now and forevermore. Amen. Let the light of service to come forth. Thank you.
about whether it's been the best week or the worst week. The fact that you are who you say you are. Lord, the fact that you are a way-making God, that you are a promise-keeping, always faithful God, allows it to be well with our soul. God, as we continue this time of worship, God, I pray that our souls would be would we be filled up, God, as we've already come to your table and experienced your presence in our lives. God, that it would continue in such a way that, that, Lord, we would have no option but to leave here changed. God, that we would go from this place and that we would reflect the love, the mercy, and the grace of Jesus everywhere we go. And as God, now we remember the, the words that your Son, our Savior, taught his disciples and all of us to pray when we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. continue in one voice as we proclaim what we believe is found and passed down to us from the early church in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and life Our second reading today comes from Acts chapter 16. So if you have your Bible or, or the app on your phone, I invite you to turn there. Um, Acts chapter 16, uh, as we continue this, this series through Acts, 
Um, we're going to be reading verses 25 through 34. I invite you to join along with me, st starting in verse 25. And it says this, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent, violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At that same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Today we're continuing our Not Ashamed sermon series through the book of Acts. What we've seen so far is these stories and acts, they, they inspire us, but they also challenge us. And our prayer is that we will be not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And so that's where we are today as we continue this through the summer. Our prayer today is that we will learn to not be ashamed to be shaken. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts gathered here be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are our Lord, our God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. So I wonder today, have you ever been in prison? Let, let me, hold on, let me clarify that. Might, might, might be too much information. Have you ever felt like you were in an internal prison? A place, a situation, or a circumstance that caused you to feel trapped, chained, or bound to something that prevented you from getting free? That's where our scripture picks up today. That's where we see Paul and Silas, a new character in the book of Acts, a, a companion of Paul who is now traveling and ministering with him. But to set the scene, we kind of need to back up a few verses and see why these two men are in prison in the first place. So they're traveling through this town, and they've been there for several days, and there's this fortune teller, this lady who, who predicts people's fortunes and what's going to happen, and her owner, she was owned, she was a slave of, of these, these people, and they made a lot of money off of her. You could pay them, and then they would tell her, tell them the future or tell them whatever. Well, she starts following Paul and Silas around, and she's yelling. Imagine this. She's yelling in the streets. These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. That doesn't sound all that bad, but over and over for days. And Paul says, I've had enough. And he basically says, in the name of Jesus, come out of this woman and cease. Well, the owners aren't very happy. You can guess why. Because they now know their money-making ticket is over. And so they say these men are causing a disturbance in the city. And they end up in prison. But before they're put in prison, they are beaten, they are flogged. They are embarrassed and humiliated. And that's where our scripture picks up today. But we see that Paul and Silas, even though they're going through this challenge, that they're not ashamed of Jesus. And they're not ashamed to be shaken. Shaken is defined as having had one's composure or confidence upset, shocked, or disturbed. And I'm going to go ahead and stop for a moment and be honest with you. Life would be great if our lives didn't have to be shaken. Amen? Can we agree on that? Some of you must like being in a blender because I don't enjoy it. It's not fun when my life is disrupted. It's not fun when my composure and my confidence is upset, it's not fun to be shocked or disturbed. But we see today 
that when it is, because church, unfortunately, it will be disturbed, it will be shaken. We can still respond in ways that show that we are not ashamed of Jesus. And I know this is going to be hard. We're working to improve our screen location. But I want to show you today some ways that I think we can learn from this scripture. How our prayer and our praises help us to live not ashamed to be shaken. So the first one is that praising God in all circumstances shows our true testimony. I don't want to ask you, so I'll speak for myself, but I've been the type of person before you get this person at church and then you get this person at home. It's not a true reflection of my real testimony, but the way that we pray and praise God in all circumstances reveals in our core who we are. Verse 25 of our scripture says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. In the late, I mean, I'm sorry, in the mid to late 2000s, so 2005 to 2010, there was a popular song that was out that I loved. Um, it was called Praise You in the Storm by Casting Crowns. And it says this, it says, And I will praise you in the storms, I will lift my hands, for you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. And I said, man, that's my song. But you know what started happening? It started storming in my life. It's unbelievable how that happens. And it started storming. I had an internal prison present itself in my life. And I did the opposite of the words of this song. I retreated from God instead of being drawn closer to God. But you see, that's kind of what happens in our lives sometimes. That's why I'm so thankful for grace. That's why I'm so thankful for second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth extra chances in life. When we praise God in the valleys, in the storms, in the prisons of our life, our faith and our true testimony shines through. We see Paul and Silas doing two specific things that I think we have to take from this. They are praying and they are praising. They are praying out to God and they are praising and they're doing that through singing hymns. Now their hymns obviously would not have been the hymns and the songs that we sing. They would have most likely have been uh, the songs. They, that was the Jewish tradition. They would have sang those instead of reading them out loud. There's a story you may have heard if you've been around Methodist circles for a while about John Wesley and the group of Moravians, these German Christians. And as he wrote this in his uh, journal entry from on January 25th, 1736, as he's going to Georgia to be a missionary. This huge storm begins to take place, and he thinks they're all going to die. And what he notices is the English Christians, those from England, are acting totally different than those who are from Germany. And he writes and he says, in the midst of their psalm, their praise, their, their hymns that they were singing, Wherever their service began, the sea broke over, split the mainsail in pieces, covered the ship, and poured in between the decks, as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English. The Germans calmly sung on. I asked one of them afterwards, Were you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. And I asked, But were your women and your children afraid? And he replied mightily, No, our women and children are not afraid to die either. This encounter would, would increase his respect for the Moravians, and he could not agree theologically with them on, on lots of issues, but the core of their faith, the fact that they were not shaken in this storm, influenced him greatly. The second thing that we see is when we pray and praise in the prisons of life, we are more aware of God's presence and his power. They are late in the night praising God. It even tells us in the midnight hour. Their prayers and their praise made them more aware that God's presence was with them in the innermost, darkest, deepest pit of this cell. They knew that God was with them. They had seen his power before in their life, and they knew 
they would see it again. There's this assurance in their soul. These men that we see today, the, the early church as a whole, they were not ashamed because they had experienced the risen Jesus in their life. And they had experienced the power of God and the faithfulness of God time and time again. There was an interesting theory that actually I first saw, it was kind of a God, not kind of, it was a God thing. When we were up at Durham for Stacy's first bone marrow transplant and she had been admitted into the hospital and I was incorrectly, as I want to state, told I could not stay with her in the hospital, but I'm not bitter about that. Can you tell? No bitterness between me and that nurse at all. I need to work on that forgiveness, I guess. But this theory popped up on my phone in some video or Bible. I don't know. I don't even know how I came across it. But it was this theory that gratitude, thankfulness, and anxiety physically cannot exist in the brain at the same time. Now, if you're like me, you instantly went, that's impossible. That's not true. I don't trust that. That's weird. Like, there's no way that's accurate. Well, as I started preparing for this sermon, I remembered that theory, and I started digging into it, and I actually found that there is evidence of this. Now, before I go any further, I want to say, uh, before any of that, first and foremost, this is not an attempt, and will never be an attempt to belittle anxiety in our lives. It is something that is real, that is outside of our control at times, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with admitting that, and there is absolutely nothing weak about publicly saying that. So I want to make sure you know that is not a lack of faith and that is not the purpose of this. But this theory goes on and it says, we can't just think happy thoughts or be more positive to make anxiety go away. But we can create a consistency of gratitude in our lives to help us combat it, to keep it from spiraling deeper out of control. And then it says gratitude is the act of recognizing and acknowledging the good things that happen that result in a state of appreciation. And then the article clearly defines the science behind it, that the feeling of gratitude when we are grateful, when we are intentionally thankful for things, that it boosts the serotonin levels and produces dopamine, which is our brain's pleasure chemical. So as it's producing those things, it's combating, it's fighting the anxiety that we feel. So I said, well, okay, that's great. So there's science behind it, but let me jump in and see what the Bible says about this before I really believe it. And the Bible, if you'll go through it from front to back, is countless verses, countless verses throughout Scripture of this back and forth between gratefulness and worry and anxiety. It's, it's I'm going to praise God in spite of having these feelings. And I, what I've noticed in my life is that as I am aware of the little blessings in my life, that anxiety doesn't always go away, but it seems to calm. It seems to calm down just a bit. And you can turn to, to lots of places, but the place that I've used over the last 15 months or so um, consistently in my studies and in my prayer life is Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And it's a familiar verse for, for some of you. It says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if we take that and we look at in light of the article that I'm referencing, then it tells us this. When those thoughts come, when that anxiety takes over, when it, when it paralyzes us, don't sit in that moment and just accept it. Get ready to fight. But we don't fight with our own strength, with our own power. It just digs the hole deeper. We fight with the power of the Holy Spirit. We fight through quoting scripture, through singing songs, through praying, through fellowshipping with other believers. Paul and Silas are doing just that. They're deep in this cell, but they are fighting. You have to imagine, they, are, they have reason to feel anxious. They have reasons to be nervous. They have reasons to be afraid. But they said, what is greater than that feeling in my life is my praise to God. And it carries them through this night. Uh, the last thing that I want us to see, um, that their prayer and their praise was to God, but it impacted others. 
So let's be clear about that. Our prayer and our praise, our worship is for God, but it is seen by others. Sometimes I think we do it for others and we hope God sees it and smiles down on it. And that's the opposite of the biblical method of worship. But we see in verse 25, it clearly tells us that the prisoners are listening. And I want you to imagine what they might have been thinking. How are these crazy people beaten like they are and they're still singing about this good God? It's midnight. If it's me, I'm thinking, when are they going to hush so I can go to bed? When is this going to stop? Who do they think they are? But they're listening. And then something happens. The power of God comes upon the place. And it says an earthquake shakes the, the, the walls and the prison is open. The, every, the chains fall off and the jailer wakes up and he thinks, oh my goodness, everybody's gone. The only thing to do is take my sword. And Paul screams out, no, 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 we're all here. Don't hurt yourself. I struggle to put myself in this story because one, I'm not sure that my prayer, my praise is always appropriate in times of, of stress and uh, anxiety and nervousness and, and struggles in life. But two, when those walls would have shaken and those chains would have come off, it's every man for himself. I'm sprinting straight out the door and I'm taking the first left and then the next right and I'm hiding in the woods as long as I have to hide. There's no way in, come on, man. You're going to run with me. I know you're going to beat me because you're faster than me. But we're going to get out of that prison. We're not going to sit there and say, well, maybe he'll be nice to us when he wakes up. No, I'm getting out of there. Paul and Silas say, I know God's going to get me out. What they didn't know was that the prisoner, I mean, the jailer was then going to say, what do I need to do to be saved? Do you see what happened? They're praising God. They're praying to God, but it's impacting other people. It wasn't for other people, but it impacts them. Long story short, they, they, they go. The jailer, his whole family is saved. They are baptized. They become believers, and they rejoice. So I wonder, have you ever considered that your testimony and the struggles of life can impact other people? Now, is that fair? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It, 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 does it mean we have to be perfect? No. We can fall short because we're human and we're in need of grace and mercy in our lives. But please don't think that, that, that your struggles in life and the way that we respond as not ashamed disciples can't impact other people because it can. I used to say I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, and I would say I'm a realist. It was like this fancy slogan I had. But basically what I was saying was I just accept things as they are and I tell you like it is. But the reality is that's not who we're called to be. The reality is that our faith, that the assurance we have tells us that these things, while they don't always turn out the way we want them, church. Do you realize that? Sometimes you have prayed a prayer, you have cried tears, you have screamed and yelled at God, and He doesn't answer the way you want Him to answer. But it does not make Him not good. When our prayers are not answered the way that we want them to be, God is still good. He is still faithful to His promises from the beginning of time through our todays and into all our tomorrows. So these two men, they're there, they're not ashamed. They, even when their life is shaken, they're not bothered because their true testimony revealed in their core who they were in the name of Jesus Christ. They were uh, aware of God's presence and, and His power. And other people were impacted because of their faith. I have zero. If you could go negative, it would be negative musical ability. But I imagine that as these men went through these struggles, these storms, these prisons, these these valleys in life, I think they would have sang the songs we've already sang this morning. Even though they didn't have those words, I think they, their experience of, of the love of Christ would have said, over the mountains and the seas, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. 
I think they knew God had been, is being, and will continue to always be a way-making, miracle-working, promise-keeping, light-in-the-darkness kind of God. I think they, they, they would have had a testimony that would have said, whatever my life thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. As I was preparing for this sermon and thinking about all this stuff and all the, 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 the real life decisions I have to make and help make and the things that I'm trying to process through in our personal struggles at home and, and with Stacy's health, I, I find myself sometimes just wanting to get lost online, like just scrolling through videos. And this, this awesome video popped up and, and I was reading the subtitles and so I clicked on it to listen and it's a, a lady who's videoing from a resort in Jamaica as the hurricane's coming. And they had made them all shelter in place, talking about killing the vibe of a vacation. But, but anyway, so she's, she's standing there, and all you can see is the corner of a hallway and a security guard peeking around to see what she's doing. And she says, I'm just recording. And way off somewhere, who knows, down that hallway, you can hear very clearly these words being sang in this beautiful Jamaican accent. It says, I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. And I thought, how awesome. These employees, they were employees of the resort. They had gathered together to worship and to sing these words over the people in their care. And I thought, wow, it's a beautiful testimony to what our faith looks like when we're not shaken. So how... Do we leave this place and do this intentionally in our lives? The first thing I think we take from Scripture is that we have to pray. There's a word, I've used this word before, you may have heard it, you may not, it's to travail. It actually means, it actually comes from kind of the, the same context as the pains of labor, birth, birthing a child. It's a deep sense of pouring our soul out to God. It's not some simple, hey God, if you could bless me kind of prayer. It's a deep groaning in your spirit to travail, to continue to pursue after God to hear your prayers, to pray scripture over the situations in your life. I think the second thing we do is we praise. That, whether that's hymns, old hymns, songs that you hear on the radio, some people like to journal. But then I want to challenge you, I want to encourage you to go back and look over scripture. Go back and look through your life and see where God's come through before. And maybe just make a little note of it. And then when that anxiety, when those prisons come, you have a list or a note in your phone and you can pull it up and you can say, he's come through before, he's going to come through again. I know he's going to come through. It might not be the way I want it, but he's going to come through because he's good and I've seen it before, so I'll see it again. Grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles. The best way you can teach your children about the goodness of God is to explain to them, we see this in the Old Testament, how He has been faithful in your life. They can handle, I promise you, they can handle more than you think they can. Tell them of the faithfulness of God. So when they go through struggles, when they enter in that weird age of middle school and high school, and they get out and they struggle, they say, my parents told me He's been good. so he's going to be good again. Our children need to know of the goodness of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working through Christ in our lives. we got to stop being timid in our faith because that's not raising up a generation that's going to make a difference in this world. I hope and I pray that our children, our youth, that they go through their life and, and it's easy. But that's probably not the reality. And if they look at their parents and their grandparents and the churches that they attend, and they see all these people are passive, they're timid, they don't really put into practice what I hear from Scripture, they're not going to follow it when it comes hard in their life. They have to see their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles and their church members 
shedding tears and lifting their hands in praise because they believe in the truth that God is good and that Jesus will see us through all the struggles of this life. I want to be the type of disciple that lives not ashamed. I'm not there yet. But man, I want to be that kind of disciple. I want to be that kind of campus. I want to be that kind of church. People can say, well, they just, they're, you know, they're just a church. No, we're not. When they hear our name, when they hear Lakeside, when they hear Lyman Methodist Church, they know, I may not like all those people because they're kind of weird. But man, they truly believe in the words of Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song that you may have never heard, and, and that's perfectly fine, but it's a song that has been a blessing in my life uh, in the last few months. It's called Promises. And it starts off this way, and I think it's beautiful the way it starts off. It says, God of Abraham, you're the God of covenants and of faithful promises, time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Through the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn, when you speak a word, it will come to pass. And in these beautiful words that we've heard saying throughout our childhood, if you've grown up in church, great is your faithfulness. Paul and Silas knew the faithfulness of God. And I pray today that you know the faithfulness of God. So when our lives get shaken, when we get shook up, when we get disturbed, we can stand firm. That we will not retreat from God. We will draw closer. I've come to the realization, especially as I prepared this week, I like to try to write my, my sermons as early in the week as possible because it gives me time to change them as God prompts me to do so. I couldn't sit down and write this sermon. I sat down and wrote it yesterday. Now, the, the outline was done. We did that weeks ago as our preaching team. But I, I, I just couldn't do it because what I have decided is I wish I could protect, and maybe not me, but my family from being shaken. And I just can't. And that bothers me that I can't keep them from doing that. But all I can then do is show them that we can be not ashamed of Jesus regardless of where we find ourselves. So my prayer today is, I don't. you may be on the mountaintop of life, and if so, praise God. But you may find yourself in the darkest, most inner part of a cell that you have no idea how you even got. You may feel beaten, you may feel left alone, you may feel hopeless. But we serve a God who when they put him in the grave and all hope was lost, three days later he, he, he rose again. We serve a God that when we enter the prisons of our life, earthquakes shake the chains loose. That's who we serve. That's who we worship. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to know how loved you are. I want you to know how much God adores you as his son, as his daughter. But I also want you to know that he is faithful. And if you don't, don't take my word for it, jump into scripture and find out for yourself that he is a faithful God, he's been faithful in all our yesterdays. He's being faithful in all our today. And he's going to be faithful in all our tomorrows. So as we sing this song, I want to invite you to, to, to be not ashamed. And if the Holy Spirit tells you, hey, I want to stand up, I want to lift my hands, I need to cry, I need to come up and pray around the cross, I need somebody to pray with me, I don't know what to do, do it. Don't let the fear of what other people think of you keep you from that moment with God. But if you need to sit in your chair and you can't get the words out, then let them be sung over you. And just to open your hands, open your heart, open your life, and let God 
make a difference. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you are who you say you are. God, I thank you that when you speak a word, you see it through to completion. God, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that you are still the God of Abraham. You are still the God of every covenant you have ever made. And God, we have all the evidence we need in the resurrection of Christ to know that we have hope and we can trust you. God, I pray today that your Holy Spirit moves in such a way that it shakes us in a good way to our core, that we need a little more of Jesus when we leave this place than we thought we did when we got here. God, have your way in our lives. Make us a campus, make us a church who's not ashamed, not ashamed to be shaken, and not ashamed of Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
trying for three weeks to read this. Thank you, Carl, from, from Nick Hagler. Uh, and so, Nick, I'm glad you're here today, buddy. Um, I, I've been forgetting, and Miss Leanne's been gracious with me, but I think today she's going to throw something at me if I didn't read this. Uh, but it says, thank you for your kindness, your support, and your love. Thank you for the cards and the blankets you provided during my graduation. Uh, Nick, man, we're proud of you, buddy. Um, I think since then, it's become official that you will be playing baseball at SMC next summer. <laughs> 